Good morning guys and girls, good morning everyone, good morning YouTube, hi, hello, my name is EJ and I am back again with another narrated art time lapse video for us to take a look at, dissect, inspect, uh, and for me to look at retrospectively, uh, maybe people can learn a thing or two from it, so this is what I do, I basically look back at recordings of all my digital artwork creations and just kind of just process through verbally process through what is going on so yeah uh, today's artwork is inspired by a particular artist that i interact with on an art server that i'm part of uh, sketchzone.net and Saramish Sketch Zone group. Uh, there's another group called Sketch Zone. We're not affiliated with that. Uh, we're basically affiliated with Ramen's uh, Sketch Zone group. It's an art Discord server, basically. And uh, this particular artist who is part of that server, um, it goes by the username Milk. Uh, she actually goes by quite a few <laughs> different usernames. She goes by Milk, Under Pale Water, and calcium so if you want to check out her art station or twitter or instagram she can be found at under at under pale water if i'm not wrong uh or at calcium um actually no i think it's under at under pale water is i think her instagram hashtag let me do a quick search for it before i um attribute to the wrong artist at under pale water instagram and yes it does pull her up it pulls up her twitter she's a great artist she's an awesome artist anyways this particular artwork is inspired by one of her original characters one of her ocs and her oc is this uh mechanic girl named brie which is the first um female character 3d female character that i set up in this particular scene so there's obviously in the scene right now we're taking a look at we're taking a look at blender and this is my favorite 3d app that i use to kind of prototype my scene when i do my 2d illustration so i set up all my 3d settings and get um oh i totally forgot about this little app slash plugin that i use for blender and <laughs> that's pretty funny i just saw that um I'll talk about that in a sec. I got distracted. I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, uh, talking about Milk uh, and her particular OC. Her OC or original character is basically a mechanic of some sort. A female mechanic. She fixes things. And in an art, art server, we have a bot named Ramen to represent you know, our founder's basically our founder is ramen there she is under pill water breeze you know, there you go if you're curious at checking out her instagram that's where she is under pale water do check her out really great artist um anyways um the bot <laughs> in our art server was messing up we call it bot ramen basically and so i kind of ended up creating this artwork based on this whole thing that was going on in our server where Milk's uh, mechanic character Brie is fixing Robot Ramen because Robot Ramen is broken <laughs> so um, it's kind of like an inside joke of sorts um, that happened basically in an art server so uh, it was completely unintentional on my part too I didn't really want to make a uh, I guess a scene out of the thing that was going on it just kind of just naturally happened I just basically just wanted to do a fan art of her artwork was really what I just wanted to do and of course since Brie is a mechanic of course she has to be fixing something in in the illustration and so for it to be ending up being robot ramen which was acting up in our server um, that was completely unintentional and so it just all just kind of just naturally just came together which is cool honestly it's pretty cool so yeah but anyways that's the background to this 2d illustration that's how this particular idea of mine got started it was inspired by this group that i'm a part of uh schedule.net is a really great group um they've given me awesome awesome critiques um on my pieces uh starting out with my lack of color knowledge 
and lack of saturation knowledge which i will go over in this particular piece because this piece when it first started out was super saturated because i didn't really have saturation control then uh, and i also didn't really have a good color theory in mind well i kind of sort of did but it was it, it wasn't working for me very well because i was misapplying it in this particular case which again i'll explain a little later on but really what i wanted to talk about is what's going on in the screen simply because that's part of the conversation that i have um so in the particular scene that we're taking a look at again i mentioned this earlier i'm doing a 3d mock-up in blender and again that thing that popped up earlier is basically I, I saw this menu pop up which is not a typical blender menu and that menu corresponds to a plugin that i i'm not using anymore <laughs> because it was misfunctioning too but I, I just remembered that I use that particular plugin for this particular project and I just got super excited about it. I don't know why. But Blender is a really great um, artist tool that I use. Obviously, you do uh, you could do 3D projects and whatnot. I mainly use Blender for sculpting as well as doing my 3D mockups for 2D illustrations just to help me with perspective. Uh, and that's the reason why I had that perspective grid going on in my scene right now to kind of help me figure out where, what the perspective is. Uh, not only does it help me figure out perspective quickly, it helps me figure out lighting information, which is also very important. Um, I love realistic lighting schemes, uh, essentially, you know, so uh, I use 3D mockups to help me generate that. Um, and typically when, when I do my mockups, I, I never ever really spend any more than an hour on it because the whole point is just to kind of just get a general idea of what is going on um, lighting wise, perspective wise, really. And everything else I keep simple. I mean, you could see that all the shapes that I have are pretty much just boxes. Uh, so what I basically model are kind of like stuff that you would typically find in a machine shop. Uh, so obviously that big rectangle right next to the two rectangles that rest right that is right next to Brie are like those rolling tool cards that most car mechanic shops will have. And then on the back towards the back of her shop, you get like a workbench of some sort. And then of course behind her there's this floating car which honestly i, I kind of just wish that it was just a regular car instead of a floating car i wanted to make the whole scene look sci-fi very very futuristic but that floating car honestly kind of feels like a huge tangent in the illustration like it, it's kind of hard to decipher what is going on like it almost looks like it's not floating like it's attached to something so in hindsight now that i'm looking back at it uh looking back at this particular artwork i kind of wish that i just made it into a regular car and put wheels on it because then that would have just grounded it more into realism um I understand my whole desire for something futuristic at this point in time. Like I wanted to do something really futuristic, but I could have just done that with the design of the car. You know, I could have add, I could have made that car look like Mad Max or something, you know, like a Mad Max sort of car or like a Batman sort of car. I don't know. I could have made it look more futuristic with wheels, you know, something that's grounded. I didn't necessarily have to make it a floating car, but. I did at that time so yeah I don't think that part of the illustration worked out quite very well but anyways as soon as I'm done with my 3d mock-up I take that rendered image and then I put it on Krita and then of course I start my sketch um, sometimes I go through a two-step process with my sketch sometimes I do a quick sketch and then a finer line sketch um, sometimes I just stick with the rough sketch Sometimes, depending on what the scene is, if the scene is simple enough, I just go straight to a fine line sketch. Uh, it really just depends on the situation. In this particular instance, I 
new then i wanted brie shop to be very cluttered to look like it's busy to look like it's used to look like there's a lot of stuff to look at which is really hard to try and figure out what to put in her shop because honestly when i did my research on machine shops most machine shops just have that rolling tool cart that's it and they might have one table or two but that's it at its very basic simple level there's not that many big huge machines in most people's personal machine shop there's there's just not so i'm really surprised to find out about that or to find that out um so yeah trying to put in details in the shop was very difficult for me because i just i didn't know what to put especially in the background um so i just started making some stuff up <laughs> so yeah it, you will see it uh, especially like in the back like I, there's this really cool thing that i did in the back that i that was unexpected right um you could actually see it in the loose sketch right now you see all these wires on the left um I didn't know what my whole intention with that was. I was thinking maybe it's a robot dock docking station. There's plenty of wires going through there. Make it look all sci-fi cool or whatnot. Um, I ended up moving those wires behind Brie herself. So that it kind of makes the eye move towards Brie. Right. And so I thought that was just like a cool little touch. Um, whether it has an actual function in an actual shop, it probably doesn't. It's all aesthetics at this point. I just wanted to make her shop look busy. And that's what those wires are. But yeah, that was something that I didn't really plan on uh, until I started sketching. When I did that loose sketch, I, I didn't really know what elements I wanted. I knew that I wanted a rolling cart. I knew I wanted some form of charging machine, which is, uh, I, I initially mentioned that there was two rolling carts. It's actually just one rolling cart. And then on the left right now, it's like some form of charging machine that um, I saw online. I, I don't know what machine it was, but I just copied it because I thought that was cool. But anyways, the elements that I really just wanted in the scene was obviously Brie, Robot Ramen. I wanted some form of solar panel, which is what Robot Ramen's legs are on. Uh, I saw that power, rolling power charging thing online, which is, I ended up putting that on there. Uh, Brie's robot, which ended up being a tangent with the floating car. Those are pretty much the only things that I really just wanted element wise on there. And again, like I said, the rest of the background was just made up. Like what I see now I'm doing the line sketch on the scene. When I'm doing the line sketch on the background, I just, I didn't really know what to put. So I was just making some stuff up. See this furnace looking area that I'm working on? Like all of that is just made up just cause I didn't really know what was going on there. So yeah. But I really love the fact that I took the time to to do a detailed sketch on this um because again like i said it just really depends on the situation sometimes i don't um for the sake of speed uh, see i'm fixing breeze robot right now because i knew that it was costing attention with the floating car this was at the point in time in the illustration when I felt like that car was really off but i was so determined to just keep it there that i I didn't edit it. I, I really should have just put wheels on it just to make it look more grounded. But anyways, um, going back to what is going on. So now that I'm doing my uh, line sketch. Oh, here's the wires. I'm putting in the wires. So my whole idea be behind these wires is to basically kind of just direct the viewer's eyes into Brie. Um, so yeah, I moved that element, which I thought was a really cool, cool element to have. That was purely accidental. I thought that was really cool. But anyways, um, so what's going to happen next? <laughs> so, sorry, I lost my train of thought because I was drinking coffee for a sec. I had to take a sip. Um, 
So after this initial sketch, I'm going to start on my coloring process. Um, and again, my coloring process, the way I do my coloring process is basically I take a palette, a very simple palette that I have. It's an eight color palette that I got from Color Palette Cinema. And use basically those eight colors to just kind of just color my scene quickly. I use the random Mac brush set on a hue variation so I could get a little bit more hues. Um, so I'd lay all these colors down, all these eight colors down all over the scene. And then I would basically start working on my values. So I would either color dodge areas that needs to be light or multiply areas that needs to be dark. And I do all those color tweaks all in different layers. I do this really fast, honestly. I think I get to the point where I don't even uh, go past 30 minutes or past an hour. I know I don't go past an hour for sure doing all these edits. The whole idea is just to put some color noise down, some color information down, and really just concentrate on the values because really the values is really more important with colors. And that's the reason why... Um, I mean, color is really important. Uh, I'm not going to lie. Color is important. But if if you have to factor in value versus color, value is definitely far more important. So during this quick phase, I, I just do everything quickly as I could simply because I wanted to get to my base paint. Um, because that's when I could do all the edits that I needed to do. And there's the eight color palette on the top right. Um, you're gonna see me bring it back on later on. Um, my whole intention, basically, with the whole coloring process, is that I, eventually I know I'm gonna merge everything in one layer, and then I, I'm gonna smudge everything into recognizable shapes. And as soon as I have everything into recognizable shapes, then that's when I could change things around to how I like it. If I want to change, uh a blue color into red that all I need to do is just either paint over that blue or select that blue and then just change the hue. My main thing is to get to that base paint as quickly as I can because that will serve as basically my template for all my detailing. Um, and that's the reason why this coloring process, which is what I'm doing right now, you could see me just breeze through this like quickly, like I, like I didn't care. Um, and I do, I honestly do, but I just do this as fast as I can. I lay down the colors. Now I'm doing the multiply. Now I'm going to go back and do the color dodge. Um, and then as soon as I'm done with all the tweaks that I needed to do, I merge all of this into one layer and smudge everything around. And it's a soupy mess, but it works for me. Honestly, it's pretty it's a pretty good technique for me. It helps me a lot. See, here I am with the whole smudging thing. And then eventually I'll get into this nice little base paint where I could kind of recognize where things are. And then I use this as my basis for my detailing work. So yeah, and you could tell now that it starts it's starting to look like it's painterly. So yeah, uh, as soon as I get this base paint, I'm going to start working on detailing. My detailing is a three-step process. I delineate my edges, I accentuate my shadows, and I add highlights. Um, and I repeat that through parts of the image and whatnot. So um, Now, going back to the color, um, which I think is very, very important to talk about, especially in this particular piece, because this piece is super saturated. When I started picking colors from color palette cinema color palette cinema's colors have a tendency to be super super saturated and i use the palette i, I use the palette all the time um but i didn't tweak the saturation until maybe about two or three years after i've been using it uh clearly this was done a year ago and about a year ago was when i started changing the saturation of the color palette cinema like i think i spent like a month editing all my palettes to make it less saturated because um, that palette that I use for this particular piece was super saturated um, 
so I started using color palette cinema's colors in the first place was because I didn't really have a good color theory or I did have a good color theory but my color practice was really off and let me explain initially I was doing split complementary as my initial color theory right I would just look at the color wheel and do split complementary when I pick colors the problem with doing that in a digital setting is that split complementary really works best if you're using the you know traditional color model which is RYB unfortunately RYB does not exist well it's not instituted in a lot of digital painting programs a lot of the color model the digital painting programs use is the RGB I didn't know that there was this two distinction before um, and so when I was doing split complementary on R R RGB color space all my colors still kept looking wacky <laughs> and sketch zone kept mentioning it your colors are off your colors are off you need to take a look at it and so finally this one i switched to color palette cinema palettes just to simplify my color scheme it's worked really awesome for me because all my illustrations start out basically with an eight color palette um and there's i have about 30 palettes that's just eight color schemes that i choose from and they're all just dependent on which were are the dominant hues in that particular palette so if it's like dominantly blue hue i would call it the blue set or something so there's like you know two sets of gray maybe three or five sets of red um maybe uh one or two sets of brown or something uh, something to that effect but it basically just goes through all of the rainbow colors and i basically have like 30 palettes i choose from and that's it <laughs> it's simplified my life so much because i just basically start all my illustrations on just those 30 palettes it's very grateful and the problem with a lot of those palettes are that they're super saturated and i didn't tweak all those palettes until again maybe at two years after i started using it and and i made it less saturated um so yeah to help me control my saturation and whatnot but yeah i wanted to mention that because i really love this piece i really like this piece and i still think that the saturation levels on this was okay i think at some point in time when i was doing my tweaks i ended up desaturating it uh, maybe I've already done it. I can't really recognize because I wasn't paying attention to the screen when I was talking. Um, but what I'm trying to get at is that um, it was just super saturated. This whole thing was just super saturated and I'm glad that um, I tweaked it enough to where it's not so confoundingly glaring i guess is a good way of putting it because it was slightly a bit jarring i did desaturate it i remember that because now looking back at the background that's so much more desaturated than it initially was so yeah which is a nice contrast because the foreground elements are super super saturated like brie is very super saturated i mean you can take a look at her right now and then the background scene is desaturated so it makes a nice little contrast so yeah but anyways um now that i've started my base paint and i've done all my color tweaks i'm about to start the detailing process and so that's what you guys will be watching in the next few minutes so let's just have a watch let's just take a look at the show right now and just kind of enjoy my process for a little bit and then i'll just come back a little later on to talk some more about this piece
Okay, so at this point, I'm pretty much done detailing the background and I'm about to start working on detailing uh, the foreground characters, which is Brie and Robot Ramen. Uh, so yeah, you see me pretty much do my three-step detailing process, which again, like I mentioned, I basically delineate my edges, which means I make my edges sharper uh, so that the shapes really clear, accentuate the shadows, so if the shadows need to be darkened a little more, I darken it a little bit, and then of course I add highlights. And sometimes every now and then I add extra details, like this thing that I'm doing on this little box right there where I put on those knobs. And honestly, I think like thinking more about it, I think that machine is a power washer. Uh, you know, those little machines that uh, people use to clean things, uh, it spits out jet water like water that is pressurized so much it comes out super fast and it just cleans things i think that's that's what that machine is i was just doing a random search for things that can be found in a machine shop and i guess a power washer can be found in the machine shop so i ended up putting that as a nice little detail in um Bree's shop <laughs> so I didn't know if she would actually ever use a power washer, but anyways, I, I thought it was just a cool little thing to add, so I added that on there. Uh, talking about critique about this piece, um, I guess the main thing that I really wanted to discuss about this piece is, again, my color practice and my saturation uh, issues. Um, I mentioned it earlier. I my color theory was i had a decent color theory in mind except my application of it was really horrible just because i didn't know of the limitations of the software i was using um again the ryb rgb I, that's something that i should have recognized early on like i didn't really think about it until wow <laughs> like uh, I guess eight years, 10 years. No, it's embarrassing. I started my digital art practice again in 2010. Like I had a digital art practice when I was a teenager, but they were all 3D. But then when I started the 2D artwork, I think it started in 2010. So I didn't really figure out my color issues, especially the RGB, RYB thing until like a year or two ago. So yeah, 10 years, it's kind of embarrassing. I should have picked up on that like way earlier, but I didn't. Um, but yeah, um, my critique is that, you know, my colors on this one is obviously way better now, now that I'm using palettes, a very simplified palette instead of, you know, freely choosing colors from the color wheel. Um, it has too much freedom, I guess, and I was <laughs> not applying it correctly. Um, but with that palette, limiting myself to that palette, it really did help a lot. Now, the only thing that I needed to tweak, obviously, which I have tweaked uh, in my current practice, is the saturation levels. I didn't really have a good working knowledge about saturation until McKinsey uh, DM7, another artist in SketchZone.net uh, or Ramen SketchZone, she mentioned this little tip. Uh, that helped a lot and so I've been using that as a guide for my saturation which the saturation recipe is really simple I, I can't quote it right now it's like ah, I forgot what it is but the way I simplify it in my head is basically this if it's a bright scene then I would want my darks to be saturated saturated my lights to be desaturated and my mids to be in between saturation, my midtones. And then if it's like a dark scene, like a nighttime scene or an interior scene, then obviously I flip it and do the opposite where the darks are desaturation, desaturated and then the lights are saturated. So with that recipe in mind, it really simplifies things in my mind and it helps a lot. Now, obviously that simple recipe is a little bit more complicated than that. Um, it was like a three paragraph recipe <laughs> when I read it and I can't quote it right now because it has many variables. Like if you change this, then you do this. If you do that, you change that. Um, but it's a really cool idea 
um, that kind of helped eliminate like what I needed to tweak with my illustration and whatnot. But yeah, simplifying it to the whole bright scene, um, lights desaturation, desaturated, dark saturated, and then for dark scenes, uh, the dark would be desaturated, the, the light would be saturated. You could just simplify it to that. So, and I'm sure you could do a Google search for saturation theories and whatnot uh, to help you with your art journey. So, yeah. But, anyways, um, so yeah, that's what I really just wanted to talk about uh, critique wise because there was a lot of things lacking in this particular piece, especially the whole saturation control. I didn't really have a good theory in mind. And then, of course, the color, um, which worked out very well in this piece, actually. Um, I really love how I ended up with really bright colors towards the foreground and desaturated muted colors on the background. So, yeah. But, yeah, I really like this piece. I really like how it turned out. I really like all the contrast in it. Um... Like I mentioned, uh, dark, very dark in the background, very light in the foreground, warm colors in the foreground, cool colors in the background, desaturated in the background, sort of. I brought back that saturation towards the end just to do a little more contrast with the red, but it all worked out harmoniously, so yeah. But yeah, I love this piece. I love how loose I, I left it, even though this is technically not a speed paint anymore. When I started this project, I really wanted it as the uh, I wanted this to be a speed paint. Which for me, my general rule is that if I'm keeping something as a speed paint, I need to do it in five hours or less. Um, this one I ended up working for seven and a half hours, so a little too long for a speed paint, so I'm not qualifying it as a speed paint anymore. But it still has the looseness of a speed paint. I mean, you can look at the background. The background is very, very sketchy looking. Uh, and so I kept that there because it makes such a nice little contrast to the foreground that obviously has a, a bit more refinement in, in its rendering and not so sketchy and loose so yeah but yeah this piece is almost done and there it is thank you guys for watching it with me i hope you guys learned a thing or two from it like and subscribe and i'll see you guys in the next video good night